Okay, we are going to start now. Um, my name is Robert Berg. I'm the Communications Coordinator at Long Island Sound Study, and welcome to our first Science Teachers Long Island Sound webinar. And uh, this webinar is sponsored by the New England Interstate Water Pollution Control Commission for the Long Island Sound Study. And uh, we especially want to thank Amy Furland of Senemi and uh, Lane Rosen at Nismia for helping to uh, get the word out. First, a warning. This is, as you could possibly tell by the beginning of this, this is the first time we've, uh, uh, that Penny or I has done a webinar, um, uh, have run a web webinar, and uh, there's going to be a, a few kinks, but hopefully it'll be, uh, it'll be full science ahead for the rest of the time. A few uh, housekeeping notes. As you could tell, the lines are on mute. Um, when we're ready to start the presentations, you can ask questions using the chat bar box. Um, I will moderate those questions, at least sorting them out and uh, giving them to Penny uh, at one point during the middle of her presentation and then for a larger Q&A uh, following the presentation. Uh, first, a few, a um, little bit of information about who we are, what is the Long Island Sound Study. Uh, we're a bi-state program sponsored by uh, EPA and the states of Connecticut and New York with a mission to restore and protect Long Island Sound. Uh, it, the program involves, uh, includes many local, federal, and interstate organizations uh, that are involved in the program's mission. Um, these are a few of them on this slide, but there's many, many more. Uh, and um, we're part of the National Estuary Program, which is a network of 28 estuaries organized by EPA to protect and restore estuaries of national significance, such as Long Island Sound. Uh, when did we start? We started in 1985 to address issues of fish kills in Long Island Sound that were caused by polluted waters that led to low levels of dissolved oxygen. Uh, early on, we started addressing other issues as well, uh, including medical waste and other debris depic uh, depositing on the shoreline, and as well as closed beaches due to pollution. Uh, our main effort is to coordinate a bi-state management plan called the Comprehensive Conservation and Management Plan, or CCMP. The plan involves trying to combine the best science available with the best management practices. Uh, we also try to involve uh, citizens trying to educate them about Long Island Sound and the management plan with a goal that an informed citizenry will want to take their own action to protect the sound. Some highlights, we fund uh, Connecticut Deep or the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection uh, to operate a water quality monitoring program at Long Island Sound Waters. Uh, we fund a large grant program called the Long Island Sound Futures Fund, uh, which we direct to communities, environmental organizations, universities and schools and citizen groups to conduct local projects to help implement the management plan, and we coordinate efforts to restore coastal habitats and fish passage in rivers. Uh, one of our biggest successes is over time, we've seen uh, hypoxia or low levels of oxygen become less severe in the sound. Uh, this is happening at the same time that communities have invested uh, quite a bit of money in upgrading wastewater treatment plants. It has resulted in a large reduction of nitrogen which is a contributor to hypoxia. Uh, since the early 90s, uh, well now more than 40 million fewer pounds of nitrogen or, uh, from sewage treatment plants are entering the sound as opposed to about 40 years ago. Uh, we've also helped restore more than 1,700 acres of coastal habitat and, 300, and over 350 miles, believe it or now, of fish passage uh, that have been opened up. Um, and also our Long Island Sound fishery remains large and diverse although not without its challenges. Uh, and that brings us to tonight's presentation, uh, which, whose basis is a study funded by the Long Island Sound Study Research Grant Program in, in 2012 to simulate the effects of climate on Long Island Sound's physical environment and living marine resources. Uh, our speaker tonight uh, was on that research team. Her name is Penny Howell. She's a senior fisheries biologist with the Connecticut with CT Deep Marine Fisheries Division. She'll be discussing tonight what measurements and tools are used to help understand uh, climate's impact on estuaries such as Long Island Sound. Uh, Penny received a Bachelor of Arts in Zoology from Connecticut College and a Master's of Science in Zoology from the University of Rhode Island. 
She's worked for DEEP for 38 years. She serves as part of a team of researchers funded through the Marine Fisheries Division's Federal Aid and Sport Fish Restoration, completing field work and data analysis analyses for several ongoing project data sets, including the Long Island Sound Trawl Survey, Coastal Sur Seine Survey, and Volunteer Fisheries Database. She serves on four technical committees of the Atlantic State Marine Fisheries Commission, which deal with interstate fisheries management issues. And as a member of the Connecticut Sea Grant Advisory Committee and the Long Island Sound Study Science and Technical Advisory Committee, she also involved, she's also involved with marine resource research and management issues here at home, including participation in the research grant program that she will be talking about tonight. So uh, if you give me a second, now I will try to transfer this uh, presentation to Penny. Okay, I'm the presenter now. You are the presenter. You have to okay. click on your presenter privileges. Um, okay, hang on. I think I have to back up and close this down because I can't see uh, where you went. Um, do you see, is my screen just blank now? I'm not sure what people see. Uh, the screen is blank. We just see the event info page, so you'll have to go to um, share, the share tab at the top, and then my screen. Uh, that's right. There we go. And it's not, it's not responding. Monitor one. Here we go. Excuse ah, me for going. the hold up here. <laughs> That's okay. And um, remember, you can um, use the chat box to ask us a question, and I will be moderating, moderating the question. Okay. Now, are we ready to go here? Yep, looks good. Everybody yep. sees my screen? That's good. Um, okay. Um, I'd like to uh, start uh, this presentation uh, focusing on the, on the teaching concepts with only a few numerical examples to illustrate these concepts. I think it's good to start with what we mean by climate change, um, how does one actually quantify such a thing, because there's an awful lot of misinformation going on around here. And I think it's very important that in a classroom that uh, we be very, very specific about what we mean and what we don't mean. Uh, if there's interest, um, then uh, it's certainly um, there's an awful lot of specific data that I can share with anyone participating in this um, uh, webinar to get actual data or spreadsheets uh, and uh, examples that can be used in the classroom. But what I'm going to uh, spend time tonight about is, how, given that you have some information, how do you do? How do you present it? What's the best way to present it? What's not a good way to present it? Uh, and um, how to uh, get your your students involved. So I'm going to start with a global view, um, and uh, then I'll show you how the data appears confusing when presented, um, but uh, how you can change the same data set to uh, talk about a clear story, and then finally give you a brief overview of the current research that's going on with climate modeling uh, close at home. So. Um, one of the most important factors in determining the extent of climate change within an ecosystem is energy flow. And energy flow is the movement of energy around an ecosystem by biotic and abiotic means. Ecological pyramids or food chains are where a sizable percentage of this energy is held, where organisms in the chain supply an energy source to other organisms and so forth, and, it's, and it goes from um, the producers through the consumers, and the whole system uh, works by an energy flow. Um, and uh, some systems have a much greater um, flow of energy than others, and those ecosystems with a great uh, flow of energy are the ones that are going to see climate change in a greater extent. Um, the ecosystems that experience big changes in energy flow include mostly the poles, that's where the news uh, usually shows polar bears stranded and that sort of thing, 
although the highest energy uh, uh, flow rate is in tropical rainforest. But another uh, system that has a very high rate of energy flow are is estuaries. Um, and um, then estu in Long Island Sound is an estuary. It's the second largest one on the East Coast. And estuaries, at first glance, may look like nothing is happening. It looks very quiet. There's, you know, no big surf. Uh, you don't see crashing uh, chunks of ice falling into the water. However, um, uh, th that couldn't be farther from the truth because they're mixing zones of fresh water and salt water and water coming off uh, the terrestrial systems. They are what's called a coupled system. And because they're coupled, the, the terrestrial, the fresh water, and the salt water, they create a large nutrient pulses. And these pulses are balanced because of the coupling of the three systems, the fresh water, salt water, and terrestrial. And this balance uh, makes the flow of energy um, most useful, and it's maximized the biological production in a very, very small area, Long Island Sound. But because of all this flux of energy and flow, this can be very confusing and mask important changes. Um, as Robert mentioned earlier, an example, uh, the DEP has been recording water temperature every month since 1969 with their water quality um, um, uh, uh, survey. I wanted to point out just for those who aren't familiar with the uh, geographic locations in the sound that that red star is Long Island is a, a Millstone Power Station and there are data that come from that uh, location as well. So if you look at the data that we get from the uh, water quality survey, it looks like there's nothing going on and it looks very variable. Um, it, it can be uh, confusing and, and very uh, difficult to figure out what physical data might uh, might be showing and uh, what you get out of this. So you can get lost in the variability of, the, of all these natural systems. The next step is you could remove all the variability um, and uh, it shows all of the data only as a single annual mean from 1991 through 2016. But that ignores most of the information that you could get out of this data set. Um, so the first step might be to um, maybe just take that same data set, not do anything drastic to it, and just change the scale to match the, the lowest and highest number. Now you can see out of that same data set that, that there is a bit of a pattern there, um, and uh, it's starting to, to make a little bit more sense. But the more that you can do with that is to figure out um, uh, a, a, an average of all the data and then express each annual mean as a change or a deviation from that overall mean. Changes each year are clear. It's the same data. I haven't done anything to it. It's just that now each year is average is expressed as the as a change from the long term average, and you can see now that 12 years are near or below average, and 14 years are above average, and most of the years that are above average are in the most recent years. So it's starting to look like there's an upward trend in the average annual bottom temperature of the sound. However, you have to be very careful about um, doing the analysis this way, and I'll just point out one error that some com uh, comes out is it's called the error of a moving baseline, where the average you choose to compare all the other years to um, can can change how the, dra the, the graph actually looks. And I think that's something that you should practice with your students with by first taking an average of all of the years from 1991 to, to uh, 2016 and creating a graph that looks like this. But then if you took the average uh, back to 1976, you would get a number that was considerably lower and then the orange bars would be taller and the blue bars would be shorter and it would look like it, it was 
uh, warming up even faster. So you have to be careful what you, what number you choose to compare your your data to. And I think the students would get quite a bit out of looking at how that changes. And it's called the error of a moving baseline. So another way to look at the exact same data set uh, is, and actually the best way, is to ter determine the real change is to apply a trend line. Uh, you can apply a trend line very easily in Excel. Uh, it's it's a, a something that comes with a, a regular, if you graph something in Excel, you can just go to uh, uh, the drop down uh, menu and say add a trend line and it, it will do it automatically. You don't even have to understand that for those that are a little more uh, knowledgeable to statistics that it's a regression line. Um, uh, and it measures the rate of change averaged over all of the data on the graph. So what you've got is a, is a trend for all of the data, and it keeps in mind all of the variation that the data um, are, are, are giving so that it truly shows what change is seen from 1991 through 2016. And then what you can say is, the black line is showing you what we would call weather. That means that every year we've got a cold year or a warm year, but the trend line is showing you climate. And you can do this with any other data set that you want. This happens to be bottom water uh, temperature. You can do it with air temperature. You can do it with times the trees uh, uh, leaf out or anything like that. But the variance around uh, that you take is is simply weather, so people say that, you know, we have a cold year or a warm year, but the trend in that data set is what we would cons consider climate, and that's the true shift in the entire data set. Now, the question always comes up when someone will say, but isn't this just a cycle? And, of course, it's a cycle. There are cycles all over uh, nature. There are natural uh, psych seasonal cycles, annual cycles, um, lunar cycles, sun cycles. But if we look more carefully on a longer data set, and this is the data set available from Millstone Power Station, I want to give them credit for ginning up all a very long data set. You can start to see that the longer data set, there are uh, cycles of cold years and warm years, but obviously the trend in this data set is increasing. The, the change has gone from an average of about 11 degrees centigrade on an average for the whole year all the way up to 12 and a half. The increasing trend is embedded in the cyclical phenomenon, and that's called climate change. And I think people have to be very clear about what's climate change and what's weather and what's cycling. And, and you can also see over this uh, data set that an increasing variation around the trend line, in other words, the highs and the lows, are also part of quote unquote climate change. And they're due to weather extremes related to that trend. So uh, when we say we're concerned about climate change, we're concerned about the upward trend, but we're also concerned about the increase in variation, where the lows are, are lower or more uh, extreme and the highs are higher. Um, so I, the next um, thing now is to um, say, why can't I get to the next? Um, if you wanted to look at an even longer time series, this is now a time series that started in 1854 and goes to 2012. Um, and it, they put it, uh, this, this is uh, data that sees surface temperature over the entire ocean. And I just put this up uh, to show a longer time series where you can clearly see cycling going on. And you can see that the very high number that we had in 2012 was seen very briefly in the 50s when we had a, a, a warming trend. But if you look at the entire data set, you can see that the very cold years or the coldest years are becoming very rare. And the warmer years are becoming much more common. And that's the trend that we would say that's the climate change that is related to all of the other variants that we see between the very warm years 
and the cold years. So um, I'll, I'll take a short break here if people want to, to type in some questions for, for, for Robert. and Because uh, the next thing I'm going to do is talk about how you relate these physical changes to biological changes. So if people know how to use the chat box, click it on um, on the right screen, on the right of the screen, if anybody has any questions. Um, all right, here's a question from, um, from Terry Randall. One second. Can you have... Students use this regression to calculate slope to find a rate of change. Yes, yes. If um, your Excel um, software, you, if you activate the data analysis tab, which I believe you just have to go into the settings, then uh, once you um, go into data analysis, you can uh, um, go analyze data, data analysis, and, and it will come up with a lot of statistical tests, and one of them will be regression. Uh, and um, you can do a full regression on, on the data. The other easier way to do it, if you, if you don't want to be exacting um, to the, um, the statistics, is when you uh, click on uh, add a trend line, you can also just ask for uh, the equation. And you can get the equation and you can get the R value. And the equation, of course, will give you the slope. Uh, it's not quite as accurate because they, uh, if you do the whole data analysis, it will uh, compensate for um, unequal sample sizes. And, um, but if you don't need that adjustment because it's minor, um, just um, getting the line drawn and, and getting the slope out of the equation is probably good enough. It's not going to... It's not going to be inaccurate. It's not going to be so wrong that it's not going to. Uh, it's not going to give you the uh, uh, the wrong idea. Okay. Um, this next question, Penny, is from Alexandra White from uh, Greenwich High School. Uh, would you recommend having students practice graphing the data themselves? And follow-up question: Is this data available to us after the seminar? Uh, yes, I I would suggest that that the students. Um, actually use the, you know, don't, don't tell them ahead of time. Um, give them the data set and then let them go through the steps of uh, finding a mean and a deviation from the mean and then the regression line. Uh, these data are available um, in graphic form. I can make uh, other data sets uh, available as a spreadsheet if um, people contact me. Actually, some of this might be available on the EPA website, uh, Robert, when, you, when we put stuff up. But I guess that's just the graphs, not the data. Um, the data might be available. Um, we'll, Penny, you and I will take a look at it, and we'll get back to the... Yeah, if anybody the wants these data sets, they, they can be made available to you. Um, does anyone else have any questions at this time? Okay, uh, I'll not, continue. We'll, we'll continue yeah. <laughs> I'll dive in. Um, uh, change, uh, relating the physical data to biological consequences can be a little tricky. To start with, seasonal averages rather than annual averages are more relevant to uh, biological processes that tend to show strong seasonality. Uh, as we did with the annual data, we can express each of the seasonal average temperatures as the difference from from the average of the entire time series. So these these uh, graphs are just a, the same as I did with the annual data. It's just I've done the summer versus the fall. Now, and this is the exact same data that I showed before. I've just broken it out by season. And you can see clearly that the uh, summer data are showing a, a very large increase in their annual ever since 2000, well, actually ever since 1999. And the fall data is showing the exact opposite that it's gone from above average to below average, except for now it's starting to go the other way a little bit. 
Uh, so now you start to get at what the mechanisms might be going on, and also it's very important that um, because they're the the summer temperatures are going to change growth patterns and uh, affect certain animals, and the fall temperatures are going to do the exact opposite. So it's almost like in the summer they turned off the air conditioner and everything warmed up, and in the fall they didn't turn the heat on and everything cooled down. And these animals now have to deal with both of those changes. Some, uh, some are going to be more affected by the summer heat. Some are going to be affected more by the, the, the fall decline in temperature. Um, now, if you take that next step and put a trend line on all four of the seasons, again, this is the exact same data. It's just broken out by all four seasons. You can see that, um, and the dash line is the uh, actual uh, annual um, average for the, the red is the summer, um, the orange is the fall, the green is the spring, and of course the, the blue is winter. I didn't put um, a trend line on the winter because statistically that trend is, is not different from zero, so it, it's uh, not valid to put a line on that. Uh, it's, it's actually showing no trend. It's just showing a lot of variance. So now you're getting at what might be affecting the animals um, in question or the plants, depending on what you're looking at, because the summer is going up very quickly. The fall is going down. The spring is going up almost to the same rate as the summer, and the winter is showing no change. But if you look very carefully, and this is something that the students could look at, you can see that the summer and the fall data used to track together very closely, and now they don't. And the spring data used to track very closely to the winter data, and now they don't. And there are atmospheric reasons why 1999 and 2000 were big changes for the sound, and the, and the sound has, has changed quite a bit since the early 90s. And this is a fairly short data set when it comes to climate change. It's only 26 years. The other thing I'd like to point out was, is in year, the, in everybody remembers the very cold winter we had just recently and the very cold spring that we had in 15. Um, and yet, it did not translate through to a cold summer or a cold fall, particularly. That, that is showing that the energy flow through the sound is um, very high, that the sound is acting like a heat sink. So even though we have conditions that create very cold conditions in the winter, it's not translating through to the spring or the summer. The spring and the summer are, are warming up anyway regardless of what's going on in the winter. And the fall is cooling down, but cooling down at a, at, a, at a slightly lower rate, and that may be changing. Again, there are atmospheric reasons why that's happening. Um, so another thing to, uh, to look at is species that are sensitive to uh, change in their habitat can provide a clear picture of what's going on uh, uh, locally. Um, so uh, there are many animals where the actual temperature doesn't matter as much as the extent or duration of the temperature above or below a stress threshold. Um, and what you need to do is maybe consider the change in both the location and the timing or the duration um, in temperature or any other physical data you're looking at, because both of them are important biologically and they can be synergistic. Um, and you can find these kinds of information in lab studies or um, uh, distributional data for specific species. For the example for uh, the lobster and the sound, laboratory studies, and these are published, showed that, the, uh, that this particular animal is very sensitive to temperatures that are above 20 degrees centigrade, which for those who aren't comfortable with centigrade, that's about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Their, their respiratory rate is fairly normal in, at 18 degrees and 19 degrees, but in the laboratory when they jump the temperature up to 21, they go into respiratory stress. They start to pant just like a dog, and that's how they, like a dog, um, can get rid of extra heat because they, they can't get rid of it any other way. If the temperature goes up to 23, they really go into um, respiratory stress. 
um, and that works for them unless, of course, um, there isn't enough t uh, oxygen in the water because panting very fast takes up a lot of oxygen. And if there isn't oxygen in the water, which when water is warm, there's apt to be less oxygen in the water, then they that's what causes the, uh, uh, them to, to either be very limp and sick or dead. And you can see that it's a very tight um, threshold. So this particular animal has a threshold where it doesn't matter that if the temperature is 16, 17, 18, 19, they're okay. As soon as they get above 20 to 21 as a threshold, they start to go into respiratory stress. If the, t if the oxygen is low, then they really go into stress, and if the temperatures get much higher than that, then they're in real difficulty. So what we have is, um, and I take a note here, take advantage of, a, of volunteer data sets, that where we had lobstermen put uh, temperature um, recorders in their traps, and they recorded uh, daily uh, um, all summer. And we started in, 19, in 2006, and I made an average, this big, heavy black line is the average from 2006 to 2009. And you can see on average, um, uh, come uh, the first week in August, the temperature went above that stress uh, level of 20 degrees centigrade, and it stayed above that, that stress level until the end of September, early October. That was bad enough, and that was, that was true of every year, uh, 06 to 09. But then, every year since then, you've seen that we've seen the temperature go above that. So even though this was bad, where the temperatures were essentially lethal to these animals for six, seven, eight weeks, that it's it's coming even sooner than that um, in years after 2009. And every year seems to be getting worse, and it's also extending longer. So you've got a situation here where you've got a baseline situa um, data where we see that the conditions are not good for this animal. And then we also have a situation where it's um, not only rising every year, but it's, a, uh, it's continuing to be above this, this uh, stress. So one way to look at information is to create a baseline and compare all the years since then to see whether they're increasing or decreasing. And uh, um, in addition to that, if there is some kind of a stress point or information where you know an animal or um, you know a pine tree or a butterfly can't it is not um, going to do well above a certain temperature, then you can see how long that temperature is existing um, in whatever area where you're looking at. It's just two different ways of looking at, at the same uh, data. Uh, another way to look at uh, the effects of uh, uh, biological effects on, on temperature change or on climate change is to look at species richness or biodiversity is kind of the catch-all term for it. And it's just the number of different species observed in an area because it's a good measure of community stability. The more species you have that are, um, you know, some are specialists, some are, are generalists, uh, but the more species you have in an area, the more niches can be filled and uh, the more uh, resources that are in that area are being used. And it also gives more resilience because that means that each species kind of uses the environment a little bit differently. And as conditions change, you're not going to lose, you know, three quarters of the species in the area. You might lose one quarter if the number is very high. So it makes the whole uh, population, the whole community, more resistant to change. And that also teaches the students um, some pretty important ecological concepts along with just measuring how many different species they have in an area. This is a good example of what we've seen in the sound where um, uh, the species diversity for spring sampling uh, is, is staying just about equal at about 11, 11 to 12 species per sample, and, uh, but in the fall, the, num the diversity is actually going up. It used to be about the same in the spring in the early years, 84 through about 96, but then it jumped up from uh, 11 to 13, and then we've had some years where it's gone up to 15 or more. 
So that's another indication that when the waters are warm, we're getting a higher diversity. And the good news is at least when the waters are cool, we're not losing species. Uh, and that is an indication that the sound is um, doing fairly well. It's adapting to um, uh, the changes in the temperature that we're seeing, at least the fish are anyway. So uh, another way of, of looking at um, tolerances to change is to group species that are, have, have similar needs. Um, and they, they, uh, these, the approach is often called looking at guilds. Uh, a species guild. You can do it with trees, you can do it with fish, you can do it with birds. And um, what we did for an example is we looked at um, species that were cold tolerant and species that were warm tolerant. And in, in the spring, for our spring um, trawls, we could see that the cold tolerant species uh, numbers, the number of species we were seeing was going down and the, the warm tolerant species actually used to be lower and now they're higher. So in the 80s, in the spring, which we would have expected, we would have seen more cold tolerant species and fewer warm tolerant species. And now in, in the, the last few years, even in the spring, we're seeing more warm tolerant species and fewer cold. In the fall, you can see that the difference is even more uh, dramatic, where the cold adapted species uh, diversity has gone from four to three or two, whereas the warm adapted group has gone from six or seven all the way up to 10 or 11. It's almost doubled. So the diversity of warm adapted species is increasing, uh, and the cold adapted species is decreasing. Uh, lastly, just to dig a little deeper, and this is where we're getting into things that maybe might warrant another um, whole webinar, is modeling. Climate models incorporate all temperature, and what you're looking at is a very stylized map of Long Island Sound. This is the sound right here. This is the, the two forks, if you don't recognize them. This is New York City, um, Manhattan, Staten Island. Um, and this is how the model that we generated uh, looks like. And each one of these um, grids um, uh, represents physical and biological data for that location through time. Spatial distributions of the data would then are then arrayed in the computer files for each grid so that you can get a, a spatial profile and then you just run the thing over, we ran it over 37 years to show how the geography of change um, uh, plays out in one or two or uh, if it's two, this is two dimensional but the model actually runs three dimensionally because it's got depth, water depth. Um, and, and if you add time, then you have four dimensions. And, and, and with the, the time element, you can compare rates of change. And of course, for many biological systems, the rate of change is the most important. Um, and the results of this model, which I'm just going to go over very briefly, um, uh, um, shows that um, over 37 years, both empirical data and the model results show an upward temperature trend from 1979 to 2030, uh, 2013. Uh, and the sound is warming up at about a third of a degree to a 0.4 degrees centigrade, which is about half 0.5 to 0.7 degrees Fahrenheit each decade. And that means it's warmed up by one to one and a half degrees centigrade or two or two and a half degrees Fahrenheit over the last 35 years. And the, the thing that was very um, useful about this particular uh, modeling exercise is that what we did was we started with uh, the current data that we had conditions now, and we actually had the, the model run backward through time to see if, it, if the model mathematics were correct and could correctly replicate the past. That exercise is called hind casting. And once the model was, um, the information was dependable enough to quote unquote hind cast the past correctly, then we could then run it forward 
and change conditions and forecast to see what would happen and where it would happen if things changed. And um, the the data that are shown in the in the pictures to your right here show what's already happened uh, in the sound over the last 35 years. You can see that the change in in temperature from and the the dark blue is point is a plus 0.2 to a plus 0.4 degrees. Uh, and you can see that the surface and bottom temperature isn't that much difference, and here's the mean down here, that it's warming up in the narrows, which is to be expected. It's warming up along the coast of Connecticut. This is New Haven right here. This is Norwalk. Uh, over here, this is uh, Queens and down into the narrows. Um, and it's warming up almost everywhere, but it's warming up particularly along the shallow Connecticut coast and in the narrows. Um, uh, uh, so that was the results of the model as they it, it um, quote unquote hindcasted the past, but then it was run forward, uh, assuming that the trends would continue, and that's the important part about um, climate change. That once you get that trend line, then the the idea is to say, well, what would happen if that trend line continued unchanged? So um, uh, the trend now is that um, carbon dioxide in the environment is uh, going to double in about 20 years uh, at the rate that it's increasing. And if that's the case, then we're going to see very large changes as this uh, trend continues. The sound is going to warm up faster than the ocean, about twice, almost twice as fast. And uh, so is the shallow areas of the Gulf of Maine uh, uh, is also seeing the same kind of increase. Uh, so we're kind of at the forefront of uh, uh, climate change uh, in the sound and in the shallow areas. Uh, and we're, if, the, if the trend that we're seeing now continues, it's going to continue at even a faster rate than what we're seeing now. So in summary, <laughs> um, to measure change, you want to learn, use long-term data to identify a trend that's embedded within variable data. And I think that's the most important part for students to understand, that data varies. It should vary. You should see seasonal changes. You should see individual changes. But it's the trend that's embedded within that variance that is climate change. And highlight that change by graphing the deviation from an average or a comparison to a baseline condition. But be careful about which baseline condition you choose, because that baseline can change your answer. So you have to be um, aware that that's going to happen. You can look for threshold effects, because it's somehow, sometimes it's not just a linear trend, but it's a threshold over which an animal um, or a plant uh, just can't function. And you can measure change by its duration as well as its extent. And both of those um, changes in time and in area should be uh, considered. In terms of biological response, uh, identifying sensitive species or groups of species that similar, have similar tolerances makes things uh, clearer. Uh, you can compare relative change in abundance or distribution of tolerant species to versus sensitive species. So who's disappearing and who's um, coming in in great numbers, that will tell you an awful lot about what's going on. You can track just plain diversity, the number of species. Is it increasing? Is it decreasing? The number of species is kind of a thumbnail idea that the more you have, the better, because it, it gives the community resilience to overall change. Uh, and that kind of finishes up because I didn't want to put any more numbers in front of you, and I can take questions. All right, again, uh, either use the chat or I see people use the Q&A uh, for questions. Uh, this, again, is from Alexandra White. And I'm going to uh, uh, give the question to Penny, and then, Alexandra, I might put you on unmute so you can hear the response and if you have any follow-up. Uh, the question is, in the last graph with the local temperature changes, what is the relationship between the areas that are the darkest red and the mainland area that, that they are located near? This could be an interesting way to go more in depth about the causes. Uh, the biggest difference is, is um, shallow. Uh, the shallow areas are the darkest red. 
uh, and I guess I can I can back up. To, um, these areas here are shallow, but also the other thing is that um, there's less oceanic mixing in the narrows down here. I mean, this is the sh these are the shallow area, and the nature of the sound. And uh, I'd have to go into a lot more of the physical oceanography, but the sound tends to warm up in its basin right in the middle here. And um, so the fact that this is the largest area that, that shows uh, an increase, first that it's shallow and second that it's in this basin area, the, the oceanic effects kind of uh, taper off when you get uh, past Guilford or past uh, Herod Point. Uh, and then you've got this basin in the sound where that's where it warms up first in the spring and stays the warmest in the fall. Uh, and then you've got an area down here in the Narrows, which really is not only shallow except for the sill that goes right through the middle, but it also is not affected particularly by um, oceanic um, influences. Uh, and the other thing is the East River and the Hudson is also warming up, as are the rivers, especially the Norwalk River and the Housatonic. So you're getting river warming that's affecting some of these uh, areas, um, you know, so um, and the Housatonic is, I think, about right right here somewhere. Within an estuary, do you think that those shallower areas have more organisms at risk because you have those rich, diverse places like salt marshes that are in those more shallow areas? Yes, uh, I, I, that's a simplistic answer, but generally, yes. Um, I, mm -hmm. I would say that that is true. Uh, you'd have to go into the details species by species, but generally, yes, the, the diversity of species that are found in estuaries and salt marshes um, are, is very high, and th this is an area, because it is a mixing zone um, and some of the other uh, physical um, characteristics, it's changed, the climate change is changing much faster. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next question is uh, from uh, Mark Park Parker, who's a colleague of Penny at Connecticut Deep. Hi, Mark. Um, the question is, are there spring temperature level levels that trigger spawning runs up into the sound or fall temperatures that trigger warm water fish fall migrations out of the sound? Could data be used to determine shifts in earlier or later migration timing? Yes. I'm going to put you on, on mute. Uh, I don't think I can have access to your... Line uh, can, yes, can, can and, and in fact, a colleague of mine, uh, uh, um, David Ellis, published a paper on on that very thing. We've used these model results to confirm the work that he did using uh, uh, just uh, – he had certain temperature uh, data, but we've got an entire array of temperature data, and I didn't go into it, but um, the other side of this is that a, a, a certain levels, if, if there's a level of temperature that is ideal for fish migration, for instance, that temperature window, if you will, it, 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 with the forecast that we put forward, um, assuming that certain trends, the current trends continue for uh, 20 years, um, the migration will be uh, three weeks earlier in the spring, and, a pro and, and if you uh, uh, for out migration in the fall, it will be about three to four weeks later if they are looking for a key, the key temperature. Uh, for the uh, alewife um, migration of the Connecticut River, we've already shown that if the if conditions continue, uh, the, that nine degree um, cue, which is their cue to move up um, the river, uh, is 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 not only going to come sooner, but it's also going to cover more of the of the river uh, faster. Um, I, I I need a map to show you more specifically, but that's the general trends. The next question is from uh, Terry Randall, and it's, um, are there any other organisms other than lobster that are good to use as case studies for the effects of climate on a species? Uh, yes. The, uh, some of the drawback is that there aren't um, a good, as, as, as good 
laboratory information, um, and we didn't have good laboratory information until the 1999 die-off. One thing that when, a, when an organism's in trouble, then they find out more about it after the fact. Um, so lobster tends to be the, the um, animal of choice. But uh, blue crab, there's a lot of information on blue crab. There's a, a fair amount of information on green crab. Um, I'm trying to think, uh, spider crab, not so much. The crabs tend to be the ones that have this kind of knife edge uh, um, uh, response. Uh, for fish, um, the anadromous species um, are, are sensitive to temperatures and in their their up migration, and the alewife has a good uh, amount of information, uh, data sets that you can get, or data information anyway. Um, salmon, but we don't have them anymore. Um, I, I, that's all that comes to mind um, off the top of my head. Right, are there any uh, any more questions out there? All right. Um, Penny, can you uh, pass the presentation to me? Yep. Did you get it? Um, I did. Uh, no, I didn't get it yet. Yeah, I can do that. Uh, okay. So um, we have a, um, a website called listclimatechange.net. Um, and it has a section called Educators Toolbox Resource. Uh, it's a resource um, for teachers, um, which uh, we just started it, so we're trying to expand it. Uh, we did, I did create a web page this week on scientific modeling and forecasting, uh, which has um, a, um, a lot of the information that's uh, within today's uh, webinar, including um, Penny's presentation and uh, a, um, a note that she drafted called Key Concept. Uh, we're also going to see this uh, webinar was recorded. We're going to see if we can um, have a, a copy of the recording on, on that web page as well. And I want to thank you for joining us. And if you have um, any follow-up questions for Penny for myself, uh, you can uh, contact me at the Long Island Sound Study website, website email address. That's info at longislandsoundstudy.net. And uh, we also might follow up as well uh, with the uh, participants of this webinar uh, with an email thanking you and, and trying to uh, see, uh, get, get a sense of uh, what you felt about this presentation tonight. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to end the webinar.